Um, all right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Public Works Committee um, meeting. Uh, it's May 24. Um, first of all, order of business to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, Mr. Bruno on the motion, Mr. Thomas on the second. Uh, any changes, any comments? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Um, all right, thanks. What would you like to start with? Uh, you want to start with solid waste? We'll start with part, actually Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec, okay. Uh, we'll start with Parks and Rec without objection. Um, yeah, no, yeah, no. Uh, I'm going to the floor. Anybody wishing to uh, address the Parks and Rec? Uh, there being no one, we'll move right into the action agenda. Uh, um, Kevin? Uh, I'll turn this over to Dean to kind of provide you a stocking update as well as the spring zing turnout. Very good. Thank you. Uh, where we left off last meeting was uh, under the discussion of, oh my gosh, we have a lot of water. The Sacoon River is still at flood stage. We can't get our fish out fast enough. We're fortunate enough in the last two weeks for the water to come down below that stage. We've got about roughly 3,000 out. Um, and uh, and that is a good thing. We're not fully on the woods yet. We still have to get more of our, our species out here. And now the window is on the other side of this is before the water gets too low or gets too warm. So we'll be doing a lot of stocking here uh, by the end of this week and beginning of next to finish out that. Uh, just a couple quick highlights, though, for, for what we hit in the Spring River between Warrensburg and Tumblehead. Uh, we're putting out yearling trout. Rainbows are roughly in about the 9.5 inch range. Um, and the bookies are, are near the 10, 10 and a half. The two-year-olds for each of these, and I'll, very briefly, I'll touch on three places we've stocked, but the two-year-old rook trout are roughly 16 inches. The two-year-old rainbows are roughly 14 and a half. Those are some big fish. And those fish require a lot of oxygen, water, and space. So believe me, when we want to set them free and put them in the woods, they want it to. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, so we were able to hit uh, Grist Mill Riverbank uh, Tumblehead. We were able to uh, team up. The, the DEC chopper was in town. They were able to get out uh, 700 rainbows, uh, nine and three quarters out to Palmer. And we've been up to Johnsburg. We stocked it for the Derby, but we we did a good job hitting it, getting them out. And we'll have to, we're going to be able to hope to finish up next week. So that should be very good. If anyone has any questions about stocking, more than happy to answer. Good. Sounds good. Moving on to the second thing, we'll go right in the spring zing. Uh, the report I gave us, what we sort of anticipated, we're really excited about it. It was the first time we offered our, our uh, spring zinc fishing day at the hatchery uh, after a three, uh, two, three year hiatus. And we ended up in the 300 range. Our turnout this year, and I know I can't read them out to all you, but we got rank and file 216 people, great demographic from across Warren County and beyond. Uh, several out of staters had come out. And all of that, and thanks and kind to several. Parker agencies, um, Conservation District, Cornell Co-op Extension, uh, uh, local uh, vendors, Nemex Crossroads, New York State Conservation was there with them, and so was the Sheriff's Department, which was fantastic. Uh, some local fly tires, Nature Conservancy, uh, our Conservation Council, I could go down the list, and it's all on sheet and information. I uh, would like to recognize the fact that we did have, and I apologize if I miss anyone to help yell at me later, but uh, there were several dignitaries that came out, and we appreciate that, but I was in the middle of trying to put words on hooks and not getting hooked myself, but I appreciate Mr. Geary, uh, our, our chairman, coming out. Uh, Mr. Simpson was there, our assemblyman, and um, Supervisor Runyon uh, was there as well, and if anyone else was there, I apologize if I did not see you. Um, in the middle of rigging rods. And uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Mr. Hages for helping me out in the kitchen that day. So um, a great event. We had a good turnout. We look forward to it going next year. Uh, I, I just add on to that, Ron. So as, as Dean said, we had 216 participants. It broke down to 92 adults, 57 kids. Uh, I think the kids with their fishing in the pond had a blast. Uh, I digress. And updated. Do you have more? No. Well, okay. no. I'm, I apologize. 128 for adults, 88 for kids. Uh, and as far as like towns go, there were 20, I believe, 24 towns around New York State that participated, and then three, four out of state uh, from Massachusetts, from New Jersey, Maine, and Delaware.
And the last item we had under information for discussion and review was uh, the trust for Up Yonder has a new trust officer. Uh, she came up to Up Yonder last, or the Thursday previous to this. Uh, Dean and Kristen and I met with her, took her around the facility. She was very impressed. Uh, and she basically said that we were doing a great job. And we, one of the questions that we had asked her was as far as doing any work around uh, the facility uh, to kind of, you know, upgrade it. She said that we should certainly apply or submit for money to come from the grant to be or from the fund to be able to do that. Uh, so that's one of the things that we'll look at uh, if we need funding for siding, roof repairs. Uh, she said certainly put it in and they would they have a committee that reviews it. Uh, it'll be either a yay or nay, but uh, she seemed very impressed, and I believe she's going to kind of make a quarterly visit, which we appreciate because I think the last person in the trust, uh, I don't think we ever saw them except through emails, and that was it. So uh, it was a good day, uh, and again, she was very impressed, and we thank her for being there. Uh, we'll see where it goes from here. Uh, Mr. Dickens. Who was it? Ariana. You know, yeah. Um, she just moved in. She's from Saratoga. Uh, grew up on the farm. Uh, was happy to learn about the, the history of Up Yonder. Uh, her name, last name, is Steve. Yeah, it's Steve as well. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you could get that out. Well, I absolutely do. Yep. It'll come out. I'll remember for a minute. <laughs> All right. I see no pending items, so you want to move right into the next uh, agenda. We'll go right into public works. Okay, we'll go right into public works. Okay. Public works. Um, uh, first, let me offer the privilege of the floor of public works. Uh, is there anyone wishing to address the committee at this time? Yes. There being no one. Um, that, um, Kevin, what do we have here? So the first item we have on there is a new contract. This is a new contract for the construction of Village Hill, County Route 49. Uh, the bids are out right now. We They are due actually tomorrow. Uh, so I will have the lowest responsive bidder uh, available before the board meeting and the tab sheet to go along with it. Keep an action on this. I, I am. This would require a, it's a resolution for a new contract. A resolution for a new contract uh, for the reconstruction of the uh, I call it the lower section of Coolidge Hill. Now, Mr. Dickinson, on the motion, is there a second? Mr. Bruno, on the second, any further discussion? I look forward to seeing those bids. Uh, that's a reconstruction project, so that's, that's correct. Yeah. It's a serious project. All right, then we're ready for the question. All those in favor of the contract signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That carry. Next item, Kevin. So the next item that we have on there is a transfer of local match funds uh, that actually two and three are together. And it would be the second one would be to close capital project H385. This was the Benny Book Brook Culver replacement uh, on County Route 32 or Call Street. No, so this would be items two and three. Two and three, that's uh, correct. Chair, I'll take a motion. Mr. Bruno on the motion. Mr. Picking up the honest back and uh, discussion. Okay. We're really We're ready for the question. Uh, all those in favor of uh, the amendment signify and, and the um, um, transfer signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I carry. Thank you. Next item, the next item we have on there is an increased capital project. Uh, this is an increase to capital project H390 County Bridge and Culver projects based on the money allocated uh, in the budget for 2023, as well as the uh, increase to the capital project cost. Okay, let's bring this to the floor for discussion. Mr. Merlino, thank you. Is there a second? Um, Mr. Dickinson, I'm a second. Um, a discussion? And they say, and the increased dollars will come from the increased dollars will come from transfers to capital project. Transfers to capital projects. Okay. How much was it? One million one hundred seventy-two thousand eight hundred nine dollars and forty-two cents. That and again, remember, part of that is the, what we budgeted for last year. Uh, that's that's being put in, put into that uh, code. 
we typically it's put into 9950 and then during the year when I need it for bridge projects and such, we move it over. Okay. Thank you. Are we ready for the question then? All those in favor of approving uh, item four signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That carry. Next item, guys. Next item we have on there is to authorize uh, myself to execute a change order for H31 South Johnsburg Road over Mill Creek Bridge. Uh, this is for a significant change order for steel sheeting that they had to drive as a part of the project. Uh, it's for $560,000, which exceeds uh, my uh, my 10% or $50,000 of a construction contract, which the construction contract was 2,494,000. So we, this will be, uh, this, is a, this is a federal aid project. Uh, so it will be 80, 15, 5% and the 5% that the county will have will come out of uh, transfers to capital projects. So this is an allowing me to, to sign that change order. What? Right, and there was them by all uh, Chair, I'll turn a motion to bring this forward for discussion. Mr. Dickinson, Mr. Bruno, on a second. Any discussion, Mr. Bruno? First, just clarify for what we were, what's the change order, the nature of the change order? Nature of the change order was when they went to put in uh, the footing for this, they determined that the, and they were, there were soil borings taken down 35 to 50 feet. Uh, they had to go further uh, in the area where they took the borings in the area where the sheeting was going to be driven, different soil uh, underneath. So uh, it required a significant amount because that was, this is a steep embankment for South Johnsburg Road. Uh, this was a 25, 30 foot uh, arch culvert that was in there previous to this. Uh, so we had to make some significant changes. Uh, we had the designer, uh, design kind of on the fly those changes and then we were able to, to direct the contractor to go forward with it so uh, and again it's covered under the federal aid project i was just curious yep nature of the change order so thank you yep. we're ready for the question then all those in favor of approving the uh, change signify by saying aye uh, aye, aye. Opposed? Okay. Carry. Next item, Kevin. Next item we have on there is a transfer of funds, and this is the transfer of surplus road project funds to cover capital project costs and to be transferred into uh, transfers for capital projects. And you can see the the items that I'm transferring money out of uh, Sawmill Road, Harrington Hill Road, and Landon Hill Road. Okay, I'll turn a motion, Mr. Dickinson, Mr. Molino. Thank you. Any further discussion? Question? We're ready for the question. All those in favor of the transfer signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Next item. Okay. Next item. Uh, and I I'm, hate to say this, but I eventually am going to lose my confidential assistant this year. Uh, Joan Rafferty has been with the department almost 30 years. Uh, she's ready to retire. Uh, Joan has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, for DPW. Actually, we were talking about it yesterday. She's been through five superintendents. Uh, so she's had a had run the gamut with all of them. Uh, but but Joan's Joan's task, uh, you know, she takes on all the drug and alcohol testing. She she takes on all the CDL certifications and requirements, uh, as well as being, you know, my confidential assistant for many other things. So with that being said, she is leaving at the end of August. Um, I would like to be able to bring whoever her replacement may be that I hire in to get training with her. So I, I, I have about a month's worth of salary, I think, for Joan is somewhere in the, the $5,000 range. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is I'd like to transfer money to cover the cost of being able to bring somebody in temporary uh, that Joan can train over a month. Uh, or at least a month worth of salary. I know we always like to have end dates of when somebody's going to be on temporary. Uh, I, you know, until when the five thousand dollars runs out for the training, then then I wouldn't have Joan come come anymore. But uh, I definitely think I need to have her train the next individual that comes into my department. Right, uh, bring us forward for discussion, now, Mr. Dickinson, uh, Mr. Thomas on the uh, on the second. Um, let me just say, I mean, I think this is in line with some of the items that was discussed at the board meeting, John. The, um, 
the transition planning that needs to go on in some of these departments, especially some of the smaller departments, is uh, significant. And um, uh, positions have to be created that allow for whatever amount of training, in this case, 30 days, but in another department, I know it's up to six months per, per right. position uh, to, to take a hire and put them in a position to be able to do the job. So um, it would be... And, and that's assuming, of course, that we find people in the first place to uh, satisfactorily fill the positions. So, um, as as our labor force ages out and goes moves into retirement, which is we're seeing more and more and more is the case, but it isn't always the case. Sometimes it's um, move on to other jobs. You know, so, exactly how we address this, you know. As a governmental unit, do we continue to do this on a case by case basis, or do we have a more streamlined way to do this? I, I'm not sure what the correct answer is. Mr. Bruno? Yeah, I think uh, possibly somewhere you create a, a fund, if you will, to fund the transition. Uh, as you said, for instance, in the federal uh, codes, a number of, of uh, uh, code enforcement people there that are quote, aging out, and it takes, and, and you need to be certified to uh, we'll go out and do the work, and it takes months to get certified. So we're going to need, as as you're well aware, and uh, the administrator is well aware, we've looked at this and we're we're just continuing to look at it. This is just one example where we're going to need to bring to have people on board while their predecessor is still there to transition and to try to get the necessary training. So at some point, maybe we look at creating some fund, if you will, or something to, to manage this. So when these things come up, we have the necessary funds available. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm John. You no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, we had planned to take this to the personnel committee based on it. I, I believe it was uh, Supervisor Thomas made the recommendation that we develop some type of contingent positions to address these types of needs. Uh, there, there will be two different types. One is the type that Kevin's talking about today for which there is funding already in his organization uh, and his budget. So he wouldn't need additional funding for this position in this case. So we'd have a contingent for funded positions and then contingent positions that were unfunded and we'd have to make the determine where we're gonna take the, the money for that. I don't know if we put that funding in the budget to begin with, or do we just go to the general fund at the time when the situation arises? So that's what we're working at. We kind of have to take that to the personnel committee. Sure. I think in this case, since it's funded uh, and it has an end date, it's probably reasonable. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Um, I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, you have a department that has a, a thousand moving parts. You have all kinds of projects. You have all kinds of grants, state and federal, uh, local. Uh, all, I mean, all kinds of contracts. Uh, many, many with municipalities. Uh, some dealing with capital projects. Some dealing with maintenance. Um, uh, when you lose somebody like this, it's 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 a big deal. It's a big deal, and because you're not, it's not like you're three or four people deep. You know, you're not, and. Uh, so I hope that we, I hope that one month is going to be sufficient for the uh, for the training that's going to be involved, Mr. Molino. Uh, just one question at the beginning, Kevin said the end of August. She'll be leaving as of the end of August. Yes. So this is the end of July. Yeah, I would, I would hope some somebody. Hopefully, I can find somebody you know in July and bring them in. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to add the second portion of this, which I didn't state that at the same time as I was doing the other re resolution, is that it would be to create the temporary position of a confidential assistant, uh, because I need the temporary position to have another person in the in the main position. Right. See, maybe that's more important than even the money, so to speak. Uh, money is always important, of course, but that. Um, Maybe there's some way of uh, handling this uh, administratively uh, as part of uh, 
county government uh, when situations like this arise and you have to put people in training in advance of people leaving, you know, uh, and sometimes it's not always envisioned within the budget and the timing of the budget. All of a sudden somebody walks in and says, you know, by the way, I'm uh, decided I'm retiring in three months or four months or five months. You know, you're into the budget year, right? That's not, that's not always something that you know uh, in September right. of the previous year. So solid waste is a good example. Solid waste is a great example, but there are others too. So, I mean, I, I think that there's a, um, if we could make this a little more streamlined, I think it would be a good, it would be a good thing. I can't imagine anyone objecting. I mean, what you hear is that, you know, that they don't want to see it go on forever, forever. And I think what they're really saying is they don't want to, they don't want this used as a way of increasing an organization structure on a permanent basis. Yep. And I understand that concern and I share that concern. You don't want it used in that fashion. And um, without coming through the normal, the normal process, right? So I don't see another hand, Jane or Frank, that's where you All right, well, uh, have we had brought this forward yet? We have brought this forward. Um, the um, all those in favor of item seven signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? That carries. Thank you, Urban. Um, item eight. Go. Item eight is just creating that temporary position for the confidential system that you just approved the, okay. the transfer of funding. Mr. Dickinson on the motion, Mr. Bruno on the second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Real quick on the discussion items, uh, project updates. Uh, there's not a lot that has changed from last month. What I'd like to do, though, is provide some pictures of uh, the first projects that have been kind of out of the gate this year for paving projects. Uh, they all happen to be down in Queensbury because uh, they started in the south end and they're working north. So this would be Corinth Road, County Route 28, uh, Bay Road, County Route 7, and, go ahead, and Country Club Road, uh, which are all down in Queensbury. So we can pass these around. The state did that. Yeah, they had... Peckham come in to do that work. Um, that that portion of Gurney Lane in that area is state owned portion, right? Right where they stop? Is that where it's where the county owns? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, they agree. All the way on the next route nine. Yes. Uh, and uh, the side of the ground in the discussion is actually going away with some of the GMs we're discussing, but after further review, uh, we're going to drop. Uh, drop the subject. So okay. uh, there's nothing further with that. Without objection, that'll be deleted from the agenda. Thank you. And that's all I have. Okay, privilege of the floor relative to public works. And okay. we'll move into the next item then without objection. So the last portion of DPW is solid waste. So you all know. Uh, Probably a couple of months back now, we uh, hired a consultant to perform or put together an organics management plan, basically a, a roadmap for the county to move forward in our uh, in our collection of organics. Uh, and again, remember, this is a plan, uh, and we can determine once the plan becomes final of what direction we want to head. I have Brad Smith as well as David Wright from. Uh, GHD, who are going to do a presentation for us on the kind of the draft organics management plan right now. So I would ask the chairman to allow. Um, to, that would be very nice. Yeah, without objection. No. Right up at the podium. Do you have a? Do you have the uh, a thumb drive? I just tried it. I I don't tap on that one. I don't think the thing is their computer either there. I don't think it'll work. I'll have you present it. Uh, and then what we can do is I will hand out after the meeting, I will send it out to everybody on the committee. So it's the plan. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, excuse my voice. I'm, yeah, only a little bit of a lost voice this morning, but I'll do my best to project. 
Um, thank you for the opportunity to present to the committee this morning. Again, my name is David Wright. I'm looking at the consulting engineer at Google Call of GHG Consulting Services. Um, we're a large organization, but in the largest US, we have about 300 employees. And in the state of New York, uh, we have about 300, uh, a quarter of those employees. And we, uh, Brad Smith is a principal and we're based out of Syracuse. So we were invited uh, through competitive RFP to respond in supporting DPW to prepare what's called an organics management plan. The types of organics that are being considered are yard, yard waste, yard scraps, and food waste. Um, excluded from, from the plan is any bile solids or sewage uh, septic sludge. The, the vision and the purpose of the plan uh, was to allow for a composting program um, to be envisioned and to identify the opportunities that would be available to one county um, to implement local composting capacity through a variety of means. Um, the plan looked at not only a large centralized commercial composting facility, which could be either owned and operated by Warren County uh, or in partnership with private enterprise, but also um, decentralized composting capacity by simple backyard composting opportunities, drop off locations for food scraps spread across the county, as well um, looking to um, divert this material from landfill disposal. So in, in Warren County at present, majority of new scraps will be disposed of to landfill. Uh, the project was in, funded in part by the Climate Smart Community Grant Program, funded by Title 15 of the Environmental Protection Fund through NYS, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And we want to recognize that grant as part of uh, the committee presentation today. One of the tasks that uh, GHG was asked to look into was similar reference facilities in New York State. Um, three uh, examples stood out to us. The first was uh, what's happening in Ulster County with the Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency. Um, this is a facility that began a pilot in 2012, um, first for yard based composting, but over time began to introduce food scraps. And at present, in their, in their community, they have eight drop off locations all accepting food scraps, and as well um, operate what's called an aerated static pile composting system. Another reference facility we considered was in Onondaga County um, that's owned and operated by the Onondaga County Resource Recovery Agency. Uh, this was another facility with a long-standing history um, with operations initiated in as early as 2009. Um, OCRA, uh, that's the abbreviation for that entity, began a program of also doing a pilot and introducing food scraps. And currently uh, they operate a facility um, that's one of the largest food scrap composting facilities in New York State. In addition, and closer to Warren County is the town of Bethlehem, New York facility, which was also started as a yard waste composting facility using uh, lesser technology than these other two examples um, as, as windrow composting. And also recently in the last two year period, they also began to food scraps. So I think the story is that there's a lot of local, um, I'd say New York State interests uh, municipally led to uh, divert food scraps from landfill disposal. We also, as part of this study, completed a community survey. Um, the survey had great response. My understanding is a similar survey was advertised for household hazardous waste and received about 45 responses. In the case of the organics uh, program and study, we had over 170 responses. Um, the distribution is, was pretty good across most of the local towns um, here in the county. And what we found through that study is that 95% of the respondents believe that currently Warren County does not do enough in way of managing food and food scraps from landfill. So there's, there is community interest to do something. In addition, 66% of those respondents are willing to purchase locally produced compost. 45% um, are very or somewhat likely to use backyard composter. And 67% are very or somewhat likely to use a nearby drop-off station. One of the reasons we wanted to roll out this survey in concert with the pilot was to inform certain initial steps that were coming to. So we looked at a two a two part uh, program. One was a, a pilot program. The second, as I mentioned before, was a large scale composting facility. We also looked at cost, and that cost was absorbed by 
quite significant assumptions at this stage. Um, there's there are there remain some unknowns as to the quantity and type and, and quality of uh, material that can be managed. Uh, but we inform those assumptions through other uh, best cases or literature review. The pilot program that we've uh, recommended is essentially three uh, separate pillars. And this is modeled after other um, operating uh, pilot programs in the state. What's of interest to the county is that there are several existing grant programs where New York State DEC USDA, as well as other federal funding opportunities to municipalities, can either fund 50% of the pilot programs or as much as 100% of the cost of the pilot program. So we looked at backyard composting. Um, actually, Town of Queensbury already does backyard composting by putting backyard bins out for the public to purchase at cost. In addition, we considered drop-off locations and found through the community survey that the best Location for a drop off could be co located to an existing transfer station site. Um, two reasons there. One is that uh, residential uh, users of that system are already familiar to bring their waste to a transfer station. As well, it's an existing permitted facility. Most of the transfer station sites are away from sensitive receptors like neighborhoods or otherwise. And there would already be some expectation for the community that this is a waste management uh, site. Finally, we considered curbside collection, which is, if you haven't heard the term curbside collection, is an opportunity to actually have someone um, prepare your food scraps in your kitchen, put it into a separate container, bring that container to a third bin. Uh, currently, Warren County does mostly uh, single stream recycling, garbage disposal, and so there'd be a third bin, which would be an organic bin, and that could be picked up and then brought to a composting facility. Uh, Curbside collection in New York State, I'd say it's in its infancy in most upstate communities. Uh, New York City has the most advanced uh, steps forward with a pilot now expanded to all five boroughs in the next two years. Um, but that's obviously an urban character, much different from, from what you all have here in Moore County. We also considered the feasibility for a composting site um, and looked at two county-owned locations, uh, one at the Tony Pit and the other at Stone Quarry Road. Um, a site has not been selected as part of that study that was intentional um, to maintain options available as the program continues to evolve and other opportunities are identified. We also considered a range of technology. Um, without having the slides, I think I'll keep it high level. Um, we did work with a project or a study advisory committee that informed certain decisions and objectives throughout the selection of technology. Um, the advisory committee provided input to specific criteria, and we've organized those in terms of hierarchy. So I'm just going to read what that hierarchy was in view of the advisory committee's input. Um, the first was have an operating cost that's less than or equal to the current landfill disposal cost. Cost is very important. Secondly, um, an appropriate level of environmental control. The next lowest uh, importance was flexibility to adapt to a variety of organic waste inputs, followed by reduced risk of downtime, followed by uh, use, utilizing an existing site because there's opportunity to work with the private sector here. Uh, we, again, we're not wanting to limit to so only municipally owned sites today. The, the next criteria is reducing the initial capital cost of construction. And the final was minimizing the number of staff or full-time equivalent employees required to operate a facility. So following on that uh, evaluation and conceptual design, we looked at costs. And the first cost I'll present is a view of the pilot program. And the, oh, the three pillars I already mentioned of backyard composting, drop-off locations, and curbside collection are all internalized in this cost over a six month pilot period. And the range of costs we're estimating is $170,000 to $270,000. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, there are grant funding opportunities and I think DPW has expressed interest to pursue those grants for the pilot. The next <laughs> level of costs that we considered was for a large uh, county owned and operated or public private partnership uh, composting facility. In, in the aggregate of all the waste generated in Warren County, we estimate around 24,000 tons. That is um, yard waste and food waste. 
Um, that's about 33% of the total waste stream. For the purpose of sizing a um, large scale facility, we took an initial step, which was of 10,000 tons per year. So we reduced the ultimate capacity that by about 50%, given that there's a variety of factors around who will participate in the program, uh, what local industry will be interested to divert food pre and post consumer to a composting site, and what's the accessibility. So in terms of those costs, and this is over a range of technology, um, one of the technology options we reviewed was only about a million dollars of initial capital investment. That's for a turned windrow composting like the town of Bethlehem, New York facility to as high as uh, exceeding four and a half million dollars, which would be implementing very advanced technology for environmental control um, for stormwater management, leachate management, odor mitigation, and as well uh, improved process efficiency. The bottom line is how do you correlate those costs in terms of the current cost of disposal? And so we review with DPW um, the current cost of disposal being $60 per ton for disposal of landfill. Most of the waste is disposed at the waste management for your ridge landfill. Um, the town of Hay goes to a different facility. Forgive me, I, I forget which specific now. Uh, but in addition to that $60 per ton, there's also a hauling fee. So every load of trash that leaves a transfer station has associated with it a hauling fee. And that hauling or transportation cost is not part of that $60 per ton. And when we looked at the aggregate of what a composting facility large scale could cost, that range in operating cost was as low as $39 per ton to as high as $60 per ton. There's a lot of assumptions made, and I will say uh, this is still very conceptual, but it underscores that there could be a business case available to Warren County, and that business case could continue to be reviewed as a next step. So what I'll summarize all that presentation and in saying is what are the preliminary recommendations made by GHD and, and with the input of DPW and the advisory committee for the study. The first is that um, a solid waste quarter coordinator will be needed. Um, that role has been built previously, and I know it's actively being pursued to backfill someone's recent departure. As well, um, a lot of these municipally led programs have a second individual that is a recycling coordinator. And a recycling coordinator would be recommended in a three to five year time period once this program reaches some level of maturity. The second recommendation was that the county pursue grant applications for the six month pilot. Again, that estimated pilot cost is upwards of $200, or $270,000 at its higher end and as low as $100,000 depending on the duration of the pilot. As well and strategically, the county can initiate grant funding for a facility. Most of the municipally available funding is um, base is given to municipalities because it's federally driven uh, funds and the current programs can reimburse as much as 50% of the cost of capital. The third recommendation is to implement the pilot program in 2024. Uh, we just convened the ultimate final meeting of the advisory committee yesterday. And I think that there's shared uh, vision and there's a lot of momentum and the consensus was we can get to do the momentum uh, we will have gained something. Um, we would also recommend that that pilot program include a waste characterization study. Um, to date, most of the data we've reviewed is based on assumptions from the state. Uh, but the, the value of a waste characterization study as part of the pilot, it, it would help to affirm a lot of the assumptions being made. The fourth is that DPW continue to explore partnerships for private op operations. Uh, which could include a um, request for expression of interest or RFQ or RFP to solicit feedback from private industry that if the county made available a site through potential lease agreement and exchange of uh, lease uh, funds, then there would be an opportunity to co-develop or partner with private entity for the operations of that. So, uh, the fifth recommendation is to finalize the business case. Like I said, a lot of what we've considered until now is conceptual. And, and we would suggest and recommend that the assumptions be validated and a business case be formalized. And finally, um, the county can consider and also continue what is existing local support to some great initiatives that are already happening today. 
Um, there is uh, a lot of interest as demonstrated through the uh, community survey and some entities are already beginning to do something in way of backyard composting as the example of town of Queensbury um, or uh, looking at composting and community gardens. So that type of holistic approach we feel um, will continue to advance the overall body and number of uh, DPW to recycle and steps. Um, that essentially wraps my presentation, but the, I'll summarize what is the next steps. So we have a community engagement session, which is public outreach um, scheduled for June 6 at 6 p.m. Uh, community comments will be received on the draft plan, which is going to be uh, advertised as a slide presentation. Uh, we will also be giving a presentation of finalized plans to the board of supervisors during the meeting on June 14th at 6 p.m. And GHG will uh, complete our finalized written plan in June this uh, this year. And uh, with that, I appreciate everyone's attention, and it's uh, been privileged presenting to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, you know, but there'll be plenty of time at the uh, advisory committee meetings to discuss these things. But uh, you know, the, the the way I think about this is that a, a big part of our waste stream is uh, picked up privately. And um, in some parts of the state, as you know, under state law, uh, if there was recycling facilities, green waste facilities within a certain, it has to be handled that way. In our area, we don't have that, but uh, there's no reason why um, if we were uh, to either create or to partner or uh, with the private sector, which I like very much, the idea of a disposal facility that we didn't require that contracted waste, green waste to go to that facility, right? Um, and but let's just say for the sake of discussion that that's uh, forty percent of the waste stream. It might be more because you're dealing with restaurants and dealing with large providers, right, that are presently contracting for the disposal. And so, if we were to require that green waste to uh, be separated and to go to a, a composting facility, then that alone would deal with a big part of the waste stream. Right. Then you have this is the way I think about it. Then you have uh, the municipal transfer stations where you have individual homeowners and some small businesses that take their personally take their waste to the transfer stations. And now, how you get that separated uh, and delivered? Um, is a different answer, right? In other words, that, uh, for example, do they um, separate in the, in the hop home and then when they deliver, they deliver the green waste to the transfer station. And then the county, for example, picks it up and takes it to the, um, uh, to the composting facility. Um, but it seems to me those are two different, two different things, right? Uh, and um, so I'd be very interested to see within the draft plan eventually what how what your thinking is in that regard. You know, how much of the waste stream is presently contracted in our county? I would guess quite a bit, quite a bit. And how we require that to be handled in the future under a program like this is, you know, that's why we have you folks here. And, um, and and whether the disposal facility is best as a public facility, a public private facility, or a private facility, that's another question. Then there's this other part, right, which represents some percentage. I don't know exactly myself, but my guess would be a smaller percentage, but still a significant percentage uh, that comes out of the home. It goes to the transfer facility. It's actually delivered by the homeowner. And so I just would give you that as just some input, additional input in your thinking in terms of the draft plan, because it would seem to me that if, if the draft plan doesn't address those two major moving parts, then it's not really as useful uh, as, as I think it, it needs to be. That's it. I'll, I'll let 
David kind of answered that a little bit, but then again, that goes back to the pilot study that he was referring to as having drop-offs at transfer stations. Uh, but to to your point where, you know, the vicinity of where we are located to a facility, and Barbara, I thank you for bringing it to our attention yesterday, but currently DEC is reviewing that law, which is the food crack law, and that 25 mile per hour radius, and there's discussions of eliminating that. Uh, so if that's the case, there won't be that. That parameter in there anymore. Right. So that was the mean that we couldn't as part of a green waste disposal. Correct. In other words, that my guess is that there are going to have to be some local laws associated with what, whatever it is that we're doing it because there's going to be a requirement, right? We have contracts with municipalities and the transfer stations and right for pickup and delivery and those yeah. kinds of things. So there's going to have to be some you know authority behind behind all of this and that's where the report comes in is that one would think that one would hope that we're doing this because of the um uh, that it's good for the environment and also that it represents significant cost savings by taking the green waste out of our waste stream and that the net 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 is um but at least going to mitigate the future increases associated with the disposal um, but a big part of our waste stream is picked up privately, after all. And so, um, but I don't know, sitting here today, I don't know exactly what percentage that might be, but I guess is, at least in terms of green waste, in other words, there's, there's by weight and then by volume, right? That by weight, I, it, it, it may be the lion's share. Claudia, I see you. Did you have your hand up? Thank you. I, I didn't have my hand up, but I was just thinking I was very glad to hear your initial statement about the no sewage sludge, because I think that has way too many concerns about how we would manage it and what would happen with it and where it's coming from and all that. Um, but everything else I'm hearing is is great, and I look forward to the draft and wondering um, where the meeting on the 6th is. That's one was here. I just, it'll, it'll be here in this room, and it'll also be on Zoom. Mr. Brown, did I hear you mention yard waste as part of the part of this? What qualifies yard waste, or what defines yard waste? Um, in an aggregate aggregate definition, you could think of it as including, you know, what wood chips, um, green waste, uh, yard yard trimmings, uh, grass clippings. A lot of the discussion we've had with the input of the advisory committee and as well as the community is that there's a significant value on the compost that's produced being of high quality. So there, there will need to be some ongoing considerations made as to what types of yard waste would, could be accepted. And of various, various reasons, um, grass clippings present some challenges. Um, yeah, these would also be an acceptable material. It's part of the reason I asked I live in the city of Lance Falls, and currently it's a city. You bag your grass clippings, etc., and they pick it up and, and take care of it. So there had to be some uh, change, if you will, there, or some something to address that. That's a significant uh, amount, if you will, Mr. Thomas. Isn't that really the same with food waste? I mean, uh, you kind of, from what I've read, you can't have uh, meat or bones or things like that in your uh, compost. Yeah, it's a, you know, that's a good point. That's a really good point. So, so is it there going to have to be an education uh, component to this whole thing? To otherwise, you're going to end up with them right in senior. Yes, certainly. And, and actually, I mean, it, depending on the technology used, animal, animal mortality is going to be composted, and bones and all. So, you know, you, when counties begin to open the door to more challenging you know, scrap streams, like you're mentioning, meats or, or um, bone or cartilage type based material, the level of technology usually changes and would be more of like an aerated static pile composting system where the pile temperatures can be operated hotter and the process efficiencies are greater. Okay, good, because I've also seen uh, some some beef producers that actually take the uh, the hides and the bones and cartilage and they, and they create fertilizer out of them. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have a uh, 
town board meeting that evening, and, uh, and I will be missing it, but I'll uh, be talking to Mr. Hedros in advance of the meeting, and uh, so he can bring my um, questions or ideas to me. Anyone else? Ben? Thank you, Chair. I, uh, I heard you say that uh, this report would go out to the members of the committee, and I request that it go out to the fire board, as well as possibly uh, uh, members of the public who are engaged in this session for the Boston Yeah, just the supervisor, it will. Uh, it will go out to the committee, it will go out to the full board. In fact, David will be here on the 14th for the full board meeting uh, to present that draft final plan as well at that at that time as well. So the time for that uh, committee meeting is? The committee meeting is June 6th at 6 p.m. here. Okay. Uh, and it, again, it'll also be on Zoom. Correctly, we're setting up a, a Zoom for it as well. Yeah, we tried to make it a hybrid so it's accessible. Yep. Well, thank you very much. I'm trying to keep us on schedule here so that um, the next committee folks are yell at me. And thank you for being here. We certainly do look forward to appreciate you. Appreciate you. Sure, of course. I have one more thing for we still have five minutes till next committee. One about the updates on the streets. You know, when we did Country Club Road, I, I reached out to Kevin to find out what was happening as far as the bike path. And I understand that wasn't part of that project, but I'd like to know if we have or would consider a complete streets policy so that we can build those things in as much as possible. I know you already have this in your mind and you consider them, just like to make it more official if we can do that. So Claudia and I did speak about Country Club Road because uh, you all are aware that the bike path and it ends at Bird's All and then comes down kind of country club to get back on just below Sweet. Uh, so they have to travel on a roadway. Um, there is not a significant amount of room on that roadway. Not, and I, I, I want to say where I come from as a design or an engineer standpoint, most bike paths should be a minimum of eight feet. You're never going to get eight feet on the road unless you take right away. In that area, as most of you are aware, uh, the right of way on one side is Glens Falls Country Club. So if you have friends there who would love to give up that right of way, I'd be certainly willing to talk to them and, and to go forward with that. Uh, the other side of the road, uh, there'd be a significant cost associated with it because there are utilities on that side of the road and they'd have to be relocated. Uh, and, and, and even the cost of the right of way itself. So if the question came up is whether or not we should change or reduce our lanes uh, lane widths to provide a little more room for bicyclists. My fear in doing that, and, and this is, again, from an engineering standpoint, I don't want to give somebody a false sense of safety that they can traverse down that road and bring whole families on their bikes down that road now as well. It is part of the bike path. Uh, already. But you, for the most part, you get class A bicyclists who are more experienced bicyclists. David and Brad, I know you guys are walking out. I will catch up with you in a couple of minutes if that's possible. Yes, uh, uh, You know, you're more experienced bicyclists to traverse that area. Yes, there are families that do come down through there, but again, I don't want to give a false sense of safety that, oh, we, we added on six inches or added on a foot. Now you can, everybody can. Yes, it's part of the bike path, but again, I, 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 if we run the risk, it's not as FHA, FHWA considered a, a width of what a bike path should be. Uh, so with that being said, I'm more than willing and I do on all our federal aid projects and most of our local projects, if we have the right of way, I look to see if we can widen shoulders and such for that bicyclist here. Um, and we are going to, we haven't striped Country Club Road, you know, Road yet, so we're still looking at that area. The problem is it's one area, it's 27 feet, and the next area, it narrows down to 22 feet. Uh, so then I'm doing this uh, down that roadway. So uh, the, the proper way to really go about doing this is start looking at acquiring right away, uh, but then that comes down to a cost associated with it. But then we could have, you know, the the true quote unquote from FHWA proper width of bike paths to for for people to traverse traverse along that area. I'm just thinking from people coming from Lake George, there's no sign up there that says don't don't ride the bike path to Glens Falls with your family. 
no, that would be correct. crazy. We want it to be as accessible as possible, I would think. I agree. Everybody, and, and I understand what you're saying. You think that even if we can gain six inches and work on the right of way and Safe. maybe make people go slower there, that and going down the hill by the country club on. Well, this become a standard for all the county for every road that you do. That would be fine with me. I, I think we would look at it from a perspective of, of you know, bicycle or peg counts. I mean, you're not going to put bike facilities on a road that and you get an occasional, I mean, do you want to purchase, and, and again, I'm looking at it from, do you want to purchase right away along any roadway, you might have one or two bicycles that traverse the roadway. Uh, if I can grab all that right away, absolutely. <laughs> but there's a cost associated with doing it. Oh, there is. Um, Mr. Chairman, aren't the road widths up to 53 feet now? Is that what they're supposed to be? The that one, the, the most road kind of right away within the county is typically a three rod road, which is 49 and a half feet. We usually call it a 50 foot right away. That's not the case in a lot of towns. And it's not even the case on some of the county roads because they're roadway by use, yes, meaning we only maintain this distance. If we go beyond that, then we're looking at purchasing right away. Uh, certain roads, I don't necessarily need to have a lot of ditch sections to maintain so beyond the shoulder by a foot or so i that's no longer any of ours we haven't maintained it uh, and it has to be a minimum of 10 years of maintenance on the roadway still like it uh, thank you mr chairman so for example on federal aid highway i'm still road kind of road 19 going up through is there provisions there for improved bicycle no there's not and it was looked at as part of the design report and didn't it wasn't a recommendation to put any improvements in there because of ped but the ped and um, bicyclist counts through that area but it's a catch-22 isn't it mm -hmm. yes but that's the as they do the design reports and, I, and i'm not saying that every federal aid project that comes out puts those facilities in Again, it goes through a, a design approval process to determine what is needed and what isn't based on what they find out there. That's just that, you know, that goes to traffic counts and what the, what they design the roadway with for. Uh, it goes for speed and what the speedway on the, on the, what the speed on those roads is. That's all part of that design approval. Yeah, it's, it's a, um, but I, th I think the point that's being made here is uh, more broadly is that you know, we would hope that at least relative to our municipal planning, that when we're redoing a road uh, or a bridge, uh, that we're taking into consideration that people do ride bikes and do walk and jog, and that uh, where the opportunities present themselves to design for that is a good thing to do. And I think that that's more broadly the question. I mean, what ends up happening here is just for the complications is that sometimes, many times, the center of the road is not in the center of the right of way um, because of the um, the nature of the road itself, so that you have more shoulder on one side than on, on another, or in other words, they have less on one side than the other. The other thing that happens within that right of way, uh, you have your national grid and your poles, which many times are right up to the McAdam, and then you have your drainage that you have to deal with. And then they hopscotch from one side of the road to the other. They don't even consistently, I mean, this, for example, if you take a look at 9N between Lake George and Bolton, that's part of the problem we have there is the uh, the nature of uh, what's going on within the public right-of-way is that is things aren't always in the most convenient location. Uh, they, um, um, yeah. It makes the, the design for some of these things, the expanding of the shoulder, much, much more difficult. You've got to come. Yeah, just and, and again, we certainly do try and look at every one of our roads when we're doing, especially the federal aid projects, because the state and the federal highway require us to look at that. Uh, but when we're doing these local projects, we, we do look at, you know, kind of expanding. But again, most of the time it comes to right away. Uh, and believe it or not, you would, you would think at the county level that we would have more roads that are are 
kind of in fee owned by the county, but they're not. There's the majority of our roads. We see a lot of these maps from the past. They were never signed and never filed. Uh, so most of those roads are roadway by use. It would be good within the design process if there was a a box that had to be checked mm -hmm. that said, you know, within the design process, you know, that we we evaluated it relative to this and then with somebody's initials next to it so that you know that it's been satisfactorily evaluated because what ends up happening is you miss opportunities and especially with some of these projects that you may, you may miss an opportunity for a decade or more and on a bridge you can miss an opportunity for a lot longer than that as it relates to snowmobilers or uh, bikers or hikers so it's it's it would be good within the design process if 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 that was the case and now we need to conclude but i want to offer privilege of the floor i see you raising your hand you can step to the podium Oh, um, I probably don't need to. I have a big enough voice, I think. Um, so Barbara Jody and um, it's, it's, excuse me, you need it's do, for okay. people who are listening from okay. outside the meeting. Um, okay, so Barbara Jodry, and I'm also the chair. I'm here for the, actually was here for the composting, but I'm chair of the Adirondack Next Cycling Advocates. And I'm just wondering, I mean, we're very concerned about uh, making sure that the roads that are um, going to be used by bikes have. Uh, the right kind of signage and the space. And I'm wondering when you're going through the design phase, do you have access to experts that deal with cycling? There's, you know, experts around the country that are in different cities, you know, building that capability, even with their existing roads, right? Other, other towns and cities are doing it. Um, does our area have access to those kinds of people? Have we identified them? Do we know how to use them as a resource? So, Barbara, we do. Uh, most of our consultants that we use have access to those individuals. In fact, they use those individuals when they're doing bicycle facilities. Uh, again, going back to kind of a, I'll take an example of a federal aid project. Uh, we, we hire a consultant. The first thing that they look at is all existing criteria and then what they would propose. And part of that proposed criteria, criteria goes back to, again, classification of the roadway. Uh, is there significant amount of ped or bicycle counts that they can say, okay, yes, this, this should, you should have a bicycle or, or sidewalks for pedestrians here. You know, a perfect example, when we did uh, Main Street in, uh, on, in Corinth off of exit 18, believe it or not, that head counts came out there that required sidewalks on both sides of the road. I traveled that road day in and day out and I never see anybody on the sidewalk. But we have the facilities there for the use based on what, uh, again, go back to Oxfordville Road, we did not see the pet or pedestrian counts. And I really don't think there's, they had any pedestrian counts up on Oxfordville Road. Uh, and, and bicyclists, I, I think they had very minimal. So it is looked at and they do have the the access to the experts. I mean, Ethan comes to me all the time with bicycle uh, and not that Ethan's the end all be all of experts, but he, he's got a lot of knowledge on it as well. And he provides me a lot of information as well. All right, so I just wanted to say um, that I, I would love if the cycling advocates, which is a group of individuals from the community that are passionate about cycling and safety and safety issues in this area. But there is some way that we can engage as you know, kind of free experts. And you know, I would love to get more engaged uh, with you and, and see how we can help each other. Um, and I was just going to say real quick that when Lloyd was on there, God rest his soul, I just know that he passed away. Uh, Lloyd used to always reach out to me. He would provide me a list every year when you guys had your meetings, and he would invite me to the meetings to discuss some of the concerns that the the Warren County Safe and Quality Biking, which is now the Adirondack Cycling Advocates, had. Uh, a lot of the things he brought, we, we couldn't always make the changes on them, but there are some things uh, when he had brought me to the committee meetings or their meetings, we did make some of those changes. So by all means, reach out to me, invite me, and provide me lists from the from the meetings. Okay. Uh, Frank. Yes, uh, I see cyclists riding on our county roads and the, and the 10 cars. I'm concerned it's a, it's a safety hazard. And, and, and I think if the county extended the, the McAdam a further to, it would then greatly improve the safety of our bicyclists because basically there's just a road 
and the cyclists, you know, you're pulling out crossing the other line to get around them, and if there's cars coming the other way, it's definitely a safety issue to try. I think that we're inviting these people to come here and cycle, and uh, I think we're creating hazards. So, and if we create it, you know, it, it, if we do it within the design process, then at life cycle, right? You basically you've converted your infrastructure more to lend itself to a particular activity, whether it's walking or biking or whatever. And um, but if you don't take that first step, then you keep rebuilding your infrastructure without capitalizing on that opportunity. And I know you've demonstrated in your leadership, Kevin, you're more than agreeable to uh, you see it with salt and so many other different ways. So I think you hear the message today. Yep. And, um, Right. And do you have something uh, for us today? Do you have anything uh, from um, Zero Waste? Anything you want to do? go over? Would you take the podium? We're at the privilege. Um, I'll start out by passing out a pamphlet that we produced. Um, a lot of work, and I think you'll all appreciate looking at it. Um, it's a guide for reuse, repair, and recycling of price household items. And this right now we take stuff out of the waste stream. It'll help many, many people. Um, I'm here to share it basically with everybody here um, and also to ask about some financial support um, for making copies. I don't know if the public works budget would allow for that or if there's another path where we would follow. Um, we, don't, we haven't done a business plan per se or I don't have an exact amount of money. Um, probably that we could start with maybe a thousand dollars to to print these. Um, it's out of it's out of alignment, and it would be corrected before we went forward and did that. And we probably have a little more color, the blue logo, just to make it attractive. But it would be handed out at farmers markets and transport stations, um, town halls, and and zero waste is tabling at a lot of events like farmers markets, etc. Food events. And we could be part of the handout. Let's have our, our county administrator, Mr. Hajos, and uh, of course our county attorney take a look at this. Okay. Uh, it seems like a reasonable request. Um, it may require our logo on it along with yours, but I don't know. But okay. in any event, you know, you would think, right, you would think that this is a uh, something that should be done. And, and we'll definitely take a look at it, Kevin. And okay. if we can do it, how do we do it? And um, Let's get it done, uh, Ben. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not the, the uh, IP guru, but I know that a lot of uh, not-for-profits are, are um, using uh, the QR uh, codes in order to uh, to get, especially uh, for folks or people that are into IP, that they basically take a picture and and they get the whole uh, brochure and, and more information uh, about the uh, particular issue. So. If, uh, if we're going to invest in a, in a uh, uh, brochure, I would encourage also maybe a, a, a QR that people can access. Sure. And, and I think that uh, something pops into my head. I would hope that if we did print these, that we would do it on recycled paper <laughs> <laughs> or at least paper or at least paper that we knew was recyclable. Right, and relative to the inks, I hate to think that we're producing a, a brochure like this and putting it on paper that is um, not uh, recycled or recyclable. So, if we could uh, visit that question as well, um, that would be a good thing. The sooner the better, because we've done a lot of the best. We will, Kevin, we'll be right back to you with this. Then I have another. Sure, go right ahead, of course. Presentation. Um, you're probably familiar with me, Diane Collins, from our Zero Waste uh, Committee. We've been working with Public Works on what we've called modernizing the transfer stations. Modernization looks like collecting recyclables, storing them, bailing, and finding our own markets. Potential is high to make money for the towns versus the current system of paying hauling companies to take recyclables away. Cardboard, paper, plastics, the works. At your May meeting, I introduced the idea of establishing a work group to design a small demonstration project, such as collecting and storing the most marketable recyclables at a larger transfer station like Lake George or Queensbury, such as Queensbury, like renting a baler and marketing the bales, bailed items directly. The potential to earn revenue would be demonstrated and would enhance support from all the supervisors for going forward 
and modernizing all the transfer stations. Thomas Zabo, who unfortunately resigned, uh, his position was to coordinate this project along with interested supervisors. So it's on hold, but not forgotten. Over 75% of products we enjoy end up in landfill or are incinerated. It was so exciting to hear this morning's presentation about the, comp about the organics project. 45% uh, is our organics and our other items are part of that 100%. Today, I want to tell you about a consulting company we've contacted called Replenish. And here's papers for everybody to take with a little more information. Their circulatory recycling model makes landfills a thing of the past. Replenish partners with municipalities, agencies, and businesses to facilitate recycling. The municipality or other entity collects source separated recyclables, such as the corrugated cardboard, plastics, etc. Replenish provides guidance for buying or leasing an appropriate bailer, provides updates on the market prices for recyclable commodities, and connects the municipality with markets for the different recyclables. The municipality bales and aggregates the recyclables and when they have a truckload, sells them at the market rates. The buyer does the trucking. So that would impact significantly on our hauling costs. Replenish gets a small percentage like a commission from the recycler. Replenish has offered to do an in-service for us, likely by Zoom, about their circulatory recycling model. We'll follow up with Kevin, Supervisor Conover, interested supervisors, perhaps also transfer station managers about setting one up. Zero Waste feels there is possibility here for a useful partnership with Replenish, and I hope I've stirred up some interest. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. always. And thank you for your uh, support and partnership. Uh, we will be back to you on that. You'll have to arrange that. Okay, good. Um, Maybe perhaps even at a committee meeting or at the advisory committee meeting, whichever one you think is more appropriate. All right. Uh, and for the privilege of the floor, uh, there being none, the chair will a motion to adjourn. Mr. Dickerson, Mr. Bruno, on the second line, in favor of adjourning, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. We almost did it.